All right. So um, we're picking up with Rebecca Turner, and the bill is at H183, um, which is an act relating to sexual violence. <clears throat> Rebecca, thank you again for being with us. You seem to be a daily guest of Senate Judiciary lately. Seems at least this week. Uh, thank you, uh, yeah. Senator Sears. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for the record, Rebecca Turner from um, the Appellate Division Office of the Defender Generals. Uh, here on H183 this morning, and uh, I, I spoke and testified for the House Judiciary Committee and previously shared uh, the Defender General's Office's overall objection to this bill. Uh, I voiced there and will share today uh, the numerous basis for our objection, listening in on this morning's initial walkthrough and questions. I see that many of your questions are in fact basis of, of my concerns over this bill and that's, what I heard this morning regarding the meaning of consent. Um, and that is a, a, a primary concern for us. I understand the underlying motivation for this bill, but ultimately the expansive and significant amendment to the current sexual assault <clears throat> statute uh, doesn't achieve, I think, what I think the goals are hoped for goals are, and certainly doesn't make anyone safer. But Let's, let's dig into the language and specifically going into the meaning of consent. As, as other senators have voiced this morning, I too have been scratching my head as to what we are now left with as to the meaning of consent. Um, I struggled as an appellate attorney reading the, this language to discern in the negative then what is lawful consent? How can someone uh, stay on the right side of the line to avoid a mandatory life imprisonment offense. I think what is uh, striking about this bill is it really constitutes substantial government regulation of the most private acts between consenting adults. And I understand that the goal is to capture the non-consenting sexual acts. The problem here is that the lines and the meaning of it is, is now blurred. Um, and again, I wanna start, I, I was not gonna go here until the end, but I wanted to just pick up what attorney Rory Thibault shared. <clears throat> if I heard him correctly, because this is my understanding of our Supreme Court jurisprudence as well, and Michelle Child shared this as well, this while the sexual assault statute hasn't been amended for quite some time, this is a very active statute in our Supreme Court decisions. There are plenty of um, case law for attorneys to read and understand and follow. And as I heard uh, Rory Tebow, and I certainly uh, don't disagree, there, he cannot cite to any case or decision of our Vermont Supreme Court that would otherwise prevent his ability to prosecute the cases that are of concern here that I'm hearing, which is the involuntary intoxication situation, the unconscious complainant situation, um, and again, what I understood Attorney Tebow to share this morning is that he's seeking just better clarity in the statute. And I think that was striking because what we have here in this bill is actually further muddling, mudding of the waters and, and a lack of understanding. The other thing I wanted to point out to right up front is that if the concern is how to instruct the jurors on a case by case matter involving a sexual assault prosecution, um, as you probably already know, we don't have Supreme Court adopted jury instructions, which means that we have model jury instructions, which leaves it to the individual attorneys to put forward and request the most appropriate jury instructions relevant for the evidence that was presented at trial. And I think that between that trial procedure, along with our substantial Supreme Court precedent defining and developing sexual assault, um, elements, we do not need to tinker what is not broken. And certainly what is presented here just um, will create so much um, litigation alone. And again, the, the questions already asked, and I haven't heard them answered very clearly. I do not, I still do not know what consent means. Uh, it's defined all over the place, <coughs> both using broad 
language and vague, undefined language. Uh, the problem with the vague and all overbroad terms is that it leaves it open to the ultimate interpretation of the prosecutor. Uh, and whenever that happens, um, of course, you, you open up and permit discriminatory selective enforcement. Uh, Attorney Thibault um, addressed that concern that I raised before the other committee uh, by saying, well, no prosecutor will will charge otherwise clearly consensual sexual assault. And, and my response is we do the law, of course, and our constitutional rights to fundamental notice due process. Uh, we do not rest on the good graces or discretion of individual prosecutors. Um, Senator Benning already raised this as well. Whenever there is poorly defined terms, understanding here in this context, consent invariably shifts the burden to the defendant to prove that there was in fact consent. Again, that shifting of the burden to the defense to prove um, that he or she is innocent is not permitted under due process. Again, that burden lies with the prosecution squarely uh, and is contrary to our fundamental principles of, of presumption of innocence. The other thing that hasn't been talked about before, and I'm, I'm going through this quickly, but I'm going to stop and maybe get a sense from you where you'd like me to focus because I can go into each of these a little more deeply. But the next next thing that I haven't heard talked about is the page one, section 10 definition of incapable of consenting. Um, it was it was talked about this where there's references to if you have physical or mental uh, limitations, you are not you are incapable of consenting. What, while the questions this morning raise, what is the meaning of this? Who interprets that? What I wanna raise to this committee's awareness is the effect of that, that whoever falls within these categories, effectively it establishes that even if they actually consent to sex, legally they are not capable of consenting. If you think about the ramifications or implications of that, people who are physical disabilities, mental disabilities, adults who are otherwise able to consent to sex, want to have sex, to be legally stripped of that ability is how I see the effect of that added language there, page one. And then also-, also Rebecca? Yes. Sorry, could you just uh, draw that out a bit more? What, sure. What, what is the example you're um, referring to there of somebody who would meet these definitions but should be allowed legally to have sex? So again, I'm looking at page one and section 10 and capable of consenting. And let's just look at 10B. 10B is, in, is physically incapable of resisting. And I used that um, phrase to just unpackage the hypothetical of someone who is um, physically um, disabled, perhaps, and cannot cannot stand on on their own two feet, um, must rely on a wheelchair to move around. Mm -hmm. Is that is that enough that you can't or or you can't decline to participate and you can't walk out of the room quickly if your if you you know if your chair is not there. Again, are we saying that certain people, just by their physical incapabilities of re resisting, cannot then consent to sex? So I'm just pointing out that that's just one, looking at one example of one phrase. And mm -hmm. I urge the House uh, Judiciary Committee to bring in other witnesses um, who could speak specifically to the rights of, of these individuals. Now, they did hear from uh, one person but I also, I, I suggested um, another group and now I'm forgetting, but I certainly am happy to make other recommendations. Um, well, uh, to, just to take your example um, and to stay with B, um, I would think the last clause there or communicating on willingness to engage, um, even if we take the example that you're saying where someone might be, um, uh, uh, a paraplegic um, and in a wheelchair, they would theoretically they would have. 
Oh shoot, Senator Bruf, I've lost you. He's frozen. He's frozen. Okay, it's not just me. I always assume it's me when somebody freezes, yeah. but this time um, it's not, it's Philip. I can't discern where he was going. He left, he dropped off at a critical part of his question. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, I'll um I'll I'll go forward until uh, he he comes back hopefully soon. Um, does anyone else have other questions on the, on that? Well, uh, maybe not. Yeah. Um, on that ten, it looks like a rewriting of um, current law, is it not? I I saw that as as all new language. Okay. I meant, excuse me, I meant the trial procedure consent. Isn't that writing on the law? There is law. Language from 3254 that was struck, if you look under what is now subdivision six, and the physically incapable of resisting is now incorporated into the definition yeah. <clears throat> division 10. Michelle, I missed what you said where that came from. If you look at section 3254, okay, I'm and if you're looking at it in the draft, you look at subdivision six, and you look at subdivision B, and you look at the, the struck language, knows that the other person is not physically capable of resisting or declining consent. No. Yep. So, and I think Rory made a, um, a comment earlier around, uh, I think somebody had asked a question, well, why is it a certain way? And, uh, and to Rebecca's point around, because a lot of the statutes haven't been amended since they were adopted in the 70s, um, and there is a lot of case law built on that. We're trying to work within the existing framework without kind of doing a wholesale throw it all out, but trying to work with the existing structure. So the reason why 3254 is structured the way that it is is because that's how it's structured in there currently. Um, and so when there were provisions in there that might have, we were trying to consolidate um, for clarity. And so the physically, the, the physical piece is, is just brought in from 3254. Um, and with some of the witnesses who were testifying on uh, the mental and physical disability aspects, they had testified and the committee in the house worked quite a bit on trying to address their concerns around making it clear that the fact that someone has a physical or mental and or intellectual disability does not obviously then in, in, in and of itself mean that a person is incapable of consenting. Um, you, have to use it, you have to use it within the context of the statute as well as looking to the definitions to apprise the, each individual circumstance. So there may be some situations where somebody has a physical disability or an intellectual disability where they're absolutely fully capable of consenting and then there are circumstances where they're not. Thank you, Michelle. I see, I see where you're pointing at and how you pull the language. I think the significant uh, change there, though, is that it is now divorced from the mens rea. And by shifting that language uh, over to the definition section and under a category of just per se, per se. incapable of consenting, you've changed the use of that, it, it isn't such, it's not a simple thing of just reorganizing uh, the language and shifting it to make it better understood. It's actually changed the impact. And so it's significantly broadened uh, the, the categories is, is how I read it of, the, of people who cannot consent um, wealthily versus where it is currently and it's, it's within the context of someone who was charged, whether that person knew, right? The mens rea knew that they were not mentally capable, knew that they were not physically capable on and on and on, right? So I, I, I think that I understand, but that doesn't change my concerns 
in terms of um, just because that language appeared and appears currently in a different section, the, the move, the current proposed move, and the fact that it is undefined and is so broad uh, plays and combines to make it that it now to me still reads like a cap, a categorical capture of huge groups of people who are now no longer able to legally consent, even if they actually consent. And I don't think that, um, I just wanna make sure that is on this committee's radar to, to read that um, and see if, if that makes sense. And I'm happy to go deeper into it. The other, the other piece, and I just started talking about it, um, Michelle spoke about it during the initial walkthrough is the removal of the, or the additional language, to me, it's a removing of the specific intent mens rea requirement. So now, um, whatever consent means, which is problem number one, a person charged with a mandatory life in prison in charge doesn't need to actually know that there was no consent. Only that, and this is the lowest amount of proof required to, to, uh, to put someone in jail for life, only that they should have known. Now, to me, that is a strict liability offense. And um, my concern is that we do not have that level of punishment for a felony offense with so little mens rea requirement effectively none. Now the counterpoint has been that my characterization of this proposal of turning a life imprisonment felony offense strict liability that there is actually a intent requirement still embedded in the sexual assault statute and to be fair there is still a requirement that there is a knowing engagement in a sexual act and that's true. There is that is the mens rea. The question though is, does the person have to know that there was no consent? And under this proposed bill, you do, a person no longer needs to know. So you can engage in knowing sex, sexual, sexual act, and believe and know it was consensual, and, but should have known that it wasn't consensual, and therefore you are subject to this uh, life imprisonment charge. <coughs> And that is a substantial change in our current statute. And I want to, and I shared this with the House Judiciary, uh, a new case out of Washington Supreme Court, State v. Blake, uh, late February of this year, struck down um, a felony drug possession statute on its face for failing to include a mens rea element. And the Washington Supreme Court held that that was a due process violation that while the legislature is afforded substantial discretion in fashioning uh, crimes, it's within their, their wide um, powers uh, to police and, and create new laws, there are limits. And the due process limits is that you cannot assign an, a, such an extreme penalty. And in that case, felony drug possession was just five <coughs> years, not life imprisonment. You cannot do that without having at least some matching culpability in, in, in the person, in the defendant's mind. And because that was a strict liability possession drug with a five year, they struck it down. So I put that on, on um, the House Judiciary's radar as well, that A, we don't have anything comparable in our st criminal uh, statutes, that, that this is a, a gross um, exercise, an extreme, and I think unconstitutional exercise of the legislature's police powers to strip a life imprisonment felony of a mens rea requirement on the key component, and that's the question of consent. Um, and uh, and they and I I passed along the the decision to them, and uh, I didn't get a chance to follow up with discussion on that after they um, received it. So I wanted to put that there. I have a few questions, if I might. Um, first question, and I. I think I kind of tried to ask it of other witnesses, but never got a response. I did get a response of, you know, statistics about the number of cases of sexual assault in Vermont, the number of people and so forth. Have there been 
prosecutions that were unable to go forward because of foreign law. Is there a problem with our current law that makes it difficult to prosecute cases? I guess that's a question for David Scheer, but have you run into cases where you've had the state has difficulty prosecuting? I am not aware of a problem with prosecuting these cases under the current sexual assault interpretations as our, our Supreme Court case law has shared. So no, I, I'm not aware that there was a problem. I, I understood uh, Attorney Thibault as, as confirming the same. Um, and I have not seen the data showing that, um, that the number of prosecutions, the number of charges have resulted in, in and problems with um, difficulty in getting prosecutions for these types of fact scenarios that we're hearing from Attorney Tebo. I certainly don't see or know of a, a Supreme Court decision that would um, bar that prosecution on its face. Um, so no, I'm not aware of any problem. Uh, and again, I pointed to uh, the fix, if, if there is a need for a fix, and I heard Attorney Tebo say that, that he wishes the statute was clear so that jurors could be instructed more clearly on these matters. And, and again, I, I see our jury instruction law, if, there, if that's how you can put it, as being flexible on that to address it and work it into the individual fact situations. Where, where you, there... you, you keep referring to a lifetime of um, yeah. <clears throat> um, sentence, but isn't it in fact a lifetime of supervision? I, I think the maximum sentence has to be life imprisonment. Mm. Under the current 30, oh, 32, uh, is life in prison. let me see. And now it's I'm, not a mandatory though. I mean, it could be, but. No, I think, let me, let me, let me confirm that I'm pulling. I think it, I thought when we redid the sex laws, it was mandatory life um, supervision, not necessarily incarceration. So, so at the bottom of page two, it says F1 speaks to uh, shall be in prison not less than three years for a maximum and for a maximum term of life. And, a, and in addition, maybe fine, not more than 25,000. Yeah. Right. Thank you. It is up to a maximum, though. It's not a... Yeah. And I believe that the, there's further language somewhere that requires a lifetime supervision. That was one of the main things added to S1 back in 2011 or 10. Somewhere there. So. 2000 and, 2009, I think. God, time flies. I can remember because I was pregnant when we were working on that one. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so it's easy. Um, yeah, so you, you got the ages. Um, but yeah, that, I, I just want to, it isn't necessarily. Um, it's not necessarily that that's 3252 F1. This section shall be in prison not less than three years and for a maximum term of life. Yep. That's not a mandatory maximum life imprisonment. No. Right. Okay. Well, it's a range, right? Yeah. Oh. Well, not less than three uh, years. Than it's three a mandatory years. minimum of three years. Yes. And, no, and I, obviously I a, a maximum of life. Well, I'll be curious to hear from Roy, from Attorney Tebow on, on how he's, he's been interpreting that statute. But that's great. Um, so, so Oh, Roy, are you here to, do you like to count to, I mean, I'm. Um, yeah, I'll just interject that I don't think any court or prosecutors reading the life to be a uh, non-discretionary. And in fact, most sex assaults uh, that resolve by a plea agreement have substantially shorter periods of both incarcer incarceration and supervised time. Mm -hmm. I don't believe there is currently lifetime supervision. But I, I with think what's lacking there is, a, is part of this, uh, Part of what we did, if it's aggravated sexual assault or sexual assault on a child, I believe it's a mandatory life supervision. I think that's what we did. 
Well, and, and, and thanks, thank you for the, for the clarification. And to the extent though, that that changes the due process um, point, which is again, the risk of it's still exposure, up, yeah. right? Right, and, and, and again, it, that it signifies that it's our most serious felony of punishment and to not provide day-to-day, -day, every day, you know, the citizens, residents of Vermont notice of what, what it takes or to, to stay not exposed to that level of um, a felony offense is just where uh, it falls below the, the, the due process norms. Um, Senator Bruth, you're you're back. I think I'm sorry. I had to. Yeah, you, John, you you froze up, Senator yeah. Bruth. You had, I think Burlington Telecom went out of business. They didn't pay their light bill. Yeah, it, it was a severe outage. I got actually booted out of Zoom altogether. Um, but I can I can uh, remember my point, and it was it was back on page one. Section one, uh, subdivision 10, incapable of consenting, you were um, speaking about somebody who might be disabled, perhaps severely disabled and unable to walk or, or run out of the room, um, but might otherwise be um, willing to consent. Um, but I look at that last clause in B which is, or communicating unwillingness to engage, if even if somebody is severely handicapped, I would have to believe they have the ability to communicate with the person with whom they might engage in sex and could use that means of communication. If that's lacking, if someone is entirely paralyzed and can't speak or communicate in any way, then of course, they can't consent, um, and I'm 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 thinking that in a way that's a, a you know a diversion from what we're really talking about. But I just wanted to speak to that example from the disabled community. I d I don't believe that this would take a class of disabled Vermonter and make them incapable of consenting to sex um, myself. I, I think they either have a way to communicate or then they are incapable of consenting. Does that, does that make sense, Rebecca? So you uh, were- I, I, am, I am hearing, yeah, I am hearing you. I think I just disagree that, that, that it doesn't protect against that interpretation in terms of categorical. Um, capture and and um, where I, if I'm hearing you right, you're reading the last phrase of B as informing the first phrasing of physically incapable. That's really well, right. so um, at, I'm I'm trying to imagine the disabled person that you're using for the example, and you're imagining somebody, or at least I understood you to be imagining somebody who was physically incapable of running away, um, but who might want to indicate willingness to have sex. Um, and I think if there is a means of communication, verbal or, or written, um, then you could have a, a, a means of communicating willingness. Um, in the absence of any way of communicating willingness, then I believe that person is incapable of, so if you imagine somebody who is entirely paralyzed and could not move at all, I believe that person is incapable of consenting whatever their interior um, state of mind might be. Does that, does that make sense? I do, I think that 10B is broader than what you're articulating though. Um, I think that the physical, physically incapable of communicating either way is not what 10B is saying. It is much broader. So if, if that is um, where that, that intent, I just think that language is-, is Well, I, I, I think you're right. I mean, in other words, it's trying to get to um, 
people who for many reasons might be physically incapable and among them would be things mentioned elsewhere in the bill like drugs or alcohol or something like that. Um, but you, you were making a point about physical disability as though this language would deprive a segment of Vermonters of their rights to have consensual intercourse or mm -hmm. sex. I'm, I'm saying I don't read it that way. I think it, it allows for the, the disabled community to consent to sex, except in the very extreme case where somebody might be entirely paralyzed and unable to communicate. And and I and my response to that is is I I understand your 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 response. I read the commas there as yeah. these are separate phrases holding on. So is physically incapable of resisting to me is an independent clause there. Uh -oh. um, and so that I I finish that incapable of consenting means the person is physically incapable of resisting, or incapable of consenting means the person declining participation in. And, and I and agree with the earlier concerns that that wording is, is, doesn't fit, right? But that's how I'm reading each of those. Incapable of consenting, consenting means the person communicating unwillingness to engage in the conduct of the shoe. Um, again, I, I just, I see those as three categories within 10B. And, and I am, I think that the way that it's currently worded, I do believe it captures the person who is um, not able to physically, um, I don't even know what, what is physically incapable of resisting, right? I just threw out and presumed, um, you know, someone who is not, I, I am sharing, um, again, I think there's built-in biases I'm exhibiting with my, 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 my hypothetical. My point is that we shouldn't be presuming people who have physical or mental disabilities cannot consent to sex and and they that's that is the point i think that this is uh an overreach and a presumption mm -hmm. that that consenting adults um shouldn't be able to you know cannot legally consent so oh okay we would we just disagree there maybe uh, after joe's question maybe michelle could weigh in on that well before joe asked his question i'm just reading the chat and Thank you, Michelle, for giving us Title 10 Federal Definition 7 Consent. And written the way it is seems to make a lot more sense than what I'm seeing in this bill. I'm, it's easier for me to understand what I'm reading here in the chat. Um, and I like all the surrounding circumstances are to be considered in determining whether a person gave consent. And that's, I don't see that. I don't see that there. So anyway, I just make that point. Uh, and if committee and members or anybody who's a witness wants to look at that um, chat, I'm reading um, from Michelle Childs, 1028 AM, Title 10, Federal Definition Consent. <clears throat> Joe? I also sent everybody the, the link, so if you want to look at the whole context as well. Well, but uh, I'm just going to suggest that uh, as we mark up this bill to look at that actual language rather than the confusing stuff that's on front of us. Joe? Rebecca, do you know if uh, anybody from Disability Rights Vermont testified on this language? They did. Mm -hmm. They did? Yes, they did. Okay, um, Philip. I just want to go back to your comment. I'm, I'm reading the lead-in language at paragraph three. Um, where, where are you, Joe? Well, I'm on page. Oh, it's page one. Yeah. You've got this. Consent meaning words or actions. And in my eyes, what we've now done is we've said silence is an indication of non-consent. And now the way that you're reading 10B, 
um, is suggesting that there is a connection between the last phrase and the first. And I'm not seeing it that way at all. I'm seeing it just the opposite. Um, I'm still totally confused about what declining participation in has to do with that line at all, because if they're actually declining, then they are <clears throat> perfectly capable of consenting or not. And I don't think that should be in there at all. But um, mm -hmm. to me, this, this, I have to agree with Rebecca. I think it opens up another can of worms that is clearly not intended, but causes concern. Well, if I, so, Joe, I take your point. I think you're right about declining participation. I, I just think that's redundant. Um, but is physically incapable of resisting, um, and that could have the spectrum of meanings we've been talking about from being drugged or drunk all the way to um, paralysis, um, you know, because of a physical disability. Um, so I read B as saying you could be physically incapable of resisting but you could be capable of communicating willingness. So imagine somebody who's, who's uh, 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 paraplegic, they could verbally indicate willingness. And I, it seems to me that they would then not be captured by B, but they would be captured by B if they were um, physically incapable of resisting and physically incapable of communicating on willingness. Um, so, I but to me, it's think, not as it's not as broad based as Rebecca is is portraying it. I guess my response is that the the lack of any communication is now shifting into the category of that by itself yeah. is indicating non consent. <clears throat> no, so, and I, I hear you, and I I think that's a, a somewhat separate issue here. Not that, they do, not that they wouldn't come together in some cases, but here we're talking about the definition of incapable of consenting. Well, so I, I see that phrase as three separate entities. And, yeah. And hearing you read it all as one, and I guess I'm questioning the location of the commas and the word or would clearly indicate to me um, and I would argue it in court that those are three separate sections to be considered. I would argue that part of the problem is they're trying to use the, the house was trying to use the federal definition or tried to do something else with it. And it seems like the federal definition is clear. Uh, to me, I'm just a, non-lawyer who's sitting here trying to figure out how I deal with a, with a problem that is perceived to, to make sure that some person who um, commits an act, um, take the swimmer at Stanford again, woman is completely intoxicated, is unable to respond. And two guys see him sexually assaulting her. And luckily they pull him off. And um, the guy is charged and gets, you know, six months because he's a good swimmer. I think everybody's appalled at that. That sentence, everybody's appalled at what happened there. Um, we don't want to see that happen in the law. So I think that's, that's one case. But on the other hand, if you have an individual who thinks, you know, I, I just don't understand some of the language that is just not clear to me. An expression of lack of consent through words or conduct means there's no consent. Oh, really? Which I think, as Joe pointed out, silence means non-consent yeah so now the defendant has to bear the burden of proving in some fashion that there was i'm really uncomfortable with this 
I want to make sure I hear from David Shearer this morning and um, Ingrid Jonas. So I'm going to move to David. Uh, Ingrid is only able to be here from 11.45. So I see Rory. Um, we're going to mark this up next week, and hopefully you can join us then and continue this conversation. <clears throat> David, what's wrong with just using the federal definition and going from there? Senator, uh, for the record, David Chair of the Attorney General's Office. Uh, Senator, I have not, that just came up now in terms of looking at that, and I have not had a chance to review it. I apologize. Uh, been among committees this morning, but I will say that we're certainly open to making sure that this, we appreciate the committee's concerns on this. We don't want to <laughs> run into overbreath problems, constitutional problems, uh, vagueness problems in these very important cases. And we are happy to work with the committee to consider definitions that are as clear as possible. So I, I express openness to looking at that and figuring out what might be workable. Uh, but I would need a, a, a chance to, to really look at that. Um, in, in concept, I do want to say just the Attorney General's Office does uh, support the purpose of this bill. I think it's addressing really important issues. Um, and again, we do appreciate the committee's care in looking at these statutes. Um, I, I wanted to make a couple points and then really just make myself available for discussion because I think um, the sort of detail-oriented discussion the committee's having is important. Um, and I, again, want to reiterate that we think that this subject matter is incredibly important in making sure that we are um, criminalizing the behavior that needs to be criminalized is, is really, you know, essential to protecting Vermonters. And I think the network did a nice job summarizing the issues there. Um, one point that I wanted to make that hasn't been discussed at the very beginning uh, is the affirmative definition of consent that you find right on page one. We have, we do support this language that, and I'm specifically referring to adding knowing and to the consent and we have testified that way in the house. I will say that there's sort of was a bit of a scramble to make sure that we got that language right uh, at the end of the process. And one of the ways in which our office views these things is in ensuring that current prosecutions are not accidentally made more difficult by amendments um, to current language. And so I would say that we would not object, you know, after further consideration and considering the sort of movement that happened to make sure that this language was right, we would not object to keeping subsection three, the subsection three definition of consent, the same as it is currently because the sort of primary prosecutions that we see now, not the only one certainly, but one of the primary ones is the basic no consent sexual assault prosecution under A1, also on page one, just referring to 3252A1, uh, not engaging in a sexual act without the consent of the other person. That is like the, the majority case that happens and making sure that we are maintaining that ability to move forward without any unexpected litigation through changing the definitions that apply to that piece. That would be something that, uh, again, we have supported it. We do think it's workable. We understand the, uh, the thrust behind it, but also would not object to keeping it the same. We think that some of what that's accomplished, the same as it is currently, we think that some of what that's accomplishing is really accomplished in the additional language below. Uh, in 3252 on page two, for example, a lot of the sort of substance around what does knowingness constitute is captured better and more precisely in B1 and two uh, and in um, subdivision four under A. So that's a point of consideration, but again, we are, we do think it's workable as amended as well. So I don't mean to be overly confusing on that, but just wanted to bring that up for consideration. The other thing I did want to state on 3254 on page three, which has been the topic of some discussion, the specifically subdivision one, there's been some discussion on what the impact of this is, the import of it, and this is the what lack of consent is. And so on subdivision one, it says lack of, con lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. So I want to sort of restate that and try to explain precisely what that is, what that is doing. All it's really doing is saying, 
the mere fact of silence, as we've been talking about the concept of silence, the mere fact of silence is not enough to say that there is consent. That's all that that is doing. It is not saying, on the contrary, that silence equals lack of consent. That is not what that provision means. Uh, if it did say that, that would be a very dramatic change in the law and it would move Vermont law quite significantly. I actually don't think this is moving Vermont law that significantly. All it's saying, again, if we're gonna take silence as one of the examples under which some, you know, a set of facts could proceed on this is that the mere fact of silence alone uh, is not enough to constitute consent. In other words, that the simple fact of silence can't be brought up as a definitive defense because there are other things that could have been indicated as State's Attorney Tebow talked about in terms of how a encounter might unfold that would indicate a lack of consent. And that should still be arguable and perhaps dispositive depending on the specific facts. So but, uh, in two, you, but in two, David, it basically says <clears throat> an, ex an expression of lack of consent through words or conduct means there's no consent. How does that fit with one? Well, I think that they're they're addressing two different things. You know, if there's an affirmative, a, a, a known, showable expression of a lack of consent, that's that's a very clear indicator that there is no consent. And this is the law stating plainly. <clears throat> But that's the case. So if somebody says no, that means there's no consent. Or if somebody, um, you know, moves away or whatever the specific facts might be, that means there or tries to get away, which could be conduct. Um, that means there's no consent. On the contrary, the mere fact of silence, just because somebody doesn't say something, doesn't mean that there is consent. It's not enough to prove consent. That and that that's on one. That's under one. So I don't. These are not contradictory. They are different ways of describing um, what isn't consent. Senator Sears. Yes, Senator Benning. David, I am concerned about your position on this because <clears throat> the way the law currently reads, there is a discussion of whether there was or there was not consent. And it's always the burden of the state to demonstrate its case. I haven't heard anything yet about difficulty in prosecuting a case with that language just the way it's written that would require us to now make a plain statement that lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. Um, that to me shifts the burden over to the defense. And in the absence of cases where prosecutors have been hamstrung because they lost a battle on whether there was or was not consent, um, I don't understand why we're changing it. Senator, I think what, the, what that does is makes clear that resistance doesn't have to be physical resistance. It doesn't have to be some sort of a fight or something like that in order to show that... But, um, you know, you know, it, it's expand. I think it's clarifying that we're talking about various forms of um, what resistance might mean. Um, and I think that's all that's, I actually don't see this as being a dramatic change to current law. I understand that's a point of contention here, but I don't actually see this being a huge uh, shift from what the current statute says. And I don't think it's a burden shift either. I think it's simply saying that, um, <clears throat> evidence that there was, um, say, again, I'll return to the example we've been, we've been using, the mere fact of silence uh, is not enough to say that there was consent. That's just saying that, that's not a burden shift. That's just saying that um, a defendant can't say, well, I didn't hear anything, there's nothing said, and therefore there was consent. Um, and, and that's just saying like, that can't be enough. There's gotta be a, um, enough by itself. It may, in fact, be part of a pattern of conduct that sort of demonstrates uh, think, that there was consent, but it's not yeah. enough. But what you just said, David, leads me to the question of why are we doing Section 3? 
Yeah, you're moving from the word may to the words does not. And that to me is pretty clearly a shift <clears throat> from current law. And why are we doing this? If there's no cases out there demonstrating that this has been a problem in prosecutions. I think again, Senator, we're trying to be, we are trying to ensure that this is not an issue in terms of making, in terms of understanding what constitutes consent and being able to bring, um, bring cases and, 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 and ensure that we are not, um, privileging behavior or sort of willful lack of understanding or something of that nature, which might uh, present a defense that uh, makes it harder to bring a case. But again, I don't think it, the, the burden still certainly remains on the prosecution to, uh, to show the lack of consent ultimately. Well, you've stripped an ability of a defendant to make any argument in this area, as I see it. Because in the case of silence, Presently, a defendant could argue that there was lack of resistance and the defendant's understanding was that everything was fine. But now you're saying specifically, you can't make that assumption. And if you combine it with the definition, you end up in a situation where there has to be an actual affirmative action on the part of the recipient of any sexual contact in order for the defendant to be cleared of that hurdle. And I, I, not hearing that that's actually been a problem in bringing prosecutions, I'm asking again, why are we actually feeling the need to do this? Again, Senator, for the reasons I stated, and I, I do think I read it slightly differently in terms of simply saying that the, the saying something that does not, that a lack of something does not constitute consent uh, does not also mean that the sort of that the revert that the contrapositive to get really technical that the other thing has to be there. In other words, the lack of verbal or physical resistance does not constitute consent. Um, but it doesn't mean that does not not now mean that a um, that a defense can't be made saying that um, a lack of verbal or physical resistance. Um, is part of a pat is sort of part of the factual pattern that there was in fact uh, consent. It's simply saying that that um, is not by itself dispositive. It just ha it, there has to be sort of other indicators around uh, consent being present. Let me let me try and um, phrase it a little differently if I could. Eliminate all other qualifiers, meaning there's no drugs, there's no intoxication, nobody's sleeping, anything else. Mere silence as one person initiates a sexual contact, it seems to me with this change in language is not enough. The defendant can't say, I assumed there was consent. There has to be a clear act either in words or actions on the part of the recipient in order for the defendant to clear this hurdle. And in the absence of that, this language as I see it, eliminates the ability of the defendant to make any argument in that regard whatsoever. And Senator, that well, troubles me. I, I, can I just jump in and say, I, yes, I, please. See, I see what Joe is saying. And um, I do. Th I don't know if I would say it shifts the burden of proof entirely, but it does seem to me that in the situation Joe's talking about, it would inevitably come down to the defendant to argue and prove that there was some sort of um, word or action that led them to to construct in their mind consent, and if they couldn't point to any word or action, um, then it seems to me that they're liable to prosecution. So however you want to look at it, it does make it incumbent upon the, the defendant to delineate what the word or action was. And that takes us back to our discussion about the, the bill has a one sentence, somewhat vague definition of consent. And then it has a full articulation 
in various places of what is not consent. So it, it seems like it, it sort of creates this node of confusion about what consent is, and then it does increase the responsibility of the defendant. Is that what you're saying, Joe? It's exactly what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, I'm going to move on to Ingrid Jonas, um, but keep these thoughts for next week as we decide whether or not, number one, uh, how to mark up the bill, but number two, should we go forward with the bill? Um, and what should be in the bill? I'm, I'm hearing some real concern from committee members about the street right, what it might but I do want to give Ingrid an opportunity to uh, speak to the bill um, and uh, welcome. Ingrid. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Major Jonas, thank you for being with us. Thank you, sir. Thank you for um, inviting me to speak on the bill. I just this moment dropped in, so I've missed the previous discussion. And, and that's uh, fine. Actually, okay. that may be to your advantage. <laughs> Well, thank you. Uh, for the record, Ingrid Jonas, I'm a major with the Vermont State Police. Um, I have actually spent several years, as you know, working in um, this field in response to sexual violence. Um, I was a detective in several of Vermont's special investigative units and then moved on to provide uh, leader leadership and supervision in those units. Um, in, a word, in, a, in a few words, we support the bill, we support the language in the bill, and I'll talk a little bit about why. So the bill proposes to revise and clarify a wording in regard to consent to sexual activity, particularly in cases where the victim is, is vulnerable. Um, we feel that's incredibly important, and I'm going to leave that to folks today who, who provide direct support to survivors. Um, the bill also requires data collection and reporting of information concerning reports of sexual violence. And I wanna talk a little bit about that. Um, we share and support the goal of creating better ways to examine and understand both the reporting of these crimes as well as the actual outcomes of these types of reports. Um, it will be informative to everyone to see the difference between the number of cases reported and sort of where they um, conclude along the way. Um, are they successfully prosecuted? Um, do they, uh, are they successfully investigated and so forth? Um, I think what's underpinning all of this is that sexual violence is an incredibly significant issue in Vermont and is known by those of us who work in the field to be underreported we could probably spend the day talking about the reasons why. Um, we feel our system needs to work to improve the ways that we respond to um, sexual violence and this bill assists with those goals. Regarding data collection, the data is already being collected. So the actual numbers of reports, et cetera. Um, my understanding is that the crime research group um, that has a contract through Department of Public Safety has indicated that they can easily complete uh, the proposed reporting requirement as set forth in this bill. Um, and they can do that under their contract with us, with DPS. Um, I do wanna just add that um, under the commissioner's guidance and leadership, DPS has a comprehensive data initiative underway that endeavors to provide all types of data to the public from um, what I believe will be a portal from our website. Um, and that will be forthcoming this year, most likely. Um, so while our greater goal, or what we feel is ideal is to strive for sort of universal data capacities and availability to the public through systems versus kind of these um, one annual reports. Um, we do support the language in this bill. We just feel that we'll be able to provide this and many other types of data for a public portal um, sometime soon. I, I, just out of curiosity, why on or before September 1st, 2024? That's an odd date. Usually 
it might say July 1st, 2024, October 1st, um, and why 2024? I mean, the honor, honor before leaves it pretty open. Are you asking me that, Chairman? Yeah, um, how'd that get in there? Uh, that's a fair question and I don't have the answer, unfortunately. <clears throat> Oh, um, I'd have okay. to get back to you on yeah. that. Okay. Well, it may not be that important. It just seems an odd way to put it um, and an odd date to me. Also, I, um, you know, I think the, well, Senator White speaks about reports and is really troubled by the number of reports we ask for and what happens to the information. Um, I'm not sure the General Assembly needs the information as much as the general public right. um, to better understand the, the scope. Here. So, uh, I'll let Senator White look at that section and give her views on the courts because she's, she's tough on the courts. I think Major Jonas knows I'm really, really tough and mean. <laughs> I don't actually have, I think it's a good idea and I, I appreciate your answering my question my initial question was about the reports was that um, you know, um, were you able to do it and were we adding a new burden and you answered that so I appreciate that we're, yeah we're able to do it and um, <laughs> we're hoping that well, certainly in partnership with, with Crime Research Group. And um, we're hoping that again, there'll be much more global data available uh, to the public and anybody who's interested in that. Thank you. Any other questions from Major Jonas? Major, thanks for being with us this morning. Um, Thank you all, take care. Committee, this this is not a simple bill. Um, and um, is there ever you know, a simple bill in this committee? <laughs> yeah, there are once in a while. I, hopefully, the the bill we take up next week on um, there's there's usually something simple. You know, <laughs> once in a while we get a simple robocalls. Robocalls. You know, try to find somebody who likes robocalls. Um, <clears throat> I'm I'm supportive of the attempt here to rewrite the law. Um, I'm not sure we got where we want to get. And Michelle, um, can you, you you did post that information. I'm using the last couple of minutes in the chat about um, the federal definition. Seemed to read a lot better than me. Um, I'm this? working on a document that can show you the parallels between 183 and the federal definition because what's in 183, so if you look at the definition of consent that's in the federal definition, the yeah. elements that are in that definition of consent are also in 183. They're not in the definition of 183. They're mostly in section 3254 because that's how the existing chapter is structured around building out consent, you can decide to repeal 3254 and put that up into the definition of consent if you would like to do that. And so well, I, I, I put them side by side for you. Yeah, if you could. You can see. Um, but I'd like, I don't see C, all the surrounding circumstances are to be considered in determining whether a person gave consent. I don't see that in the version in front of us. That isn't in there, and that's just because that's how it always is with this with these types of cases. But you can certainly add that in there, and if it feels more comfortable for you and provides more clarity, you can add that. Just as one member of this committee, I would feel more comfortable with something like that written in there. Mm -hmm. And the and also, you know, and I so I'm going to highlight them and compare stuff because I think one of the things that people were getting stuck on is the at the uh, incapable of consenting and the physical resistance and the unwilling and the inability to communicate. And 
the incapable of physically resisting is current law in Vermont. It's just being brought in from another section. And then the two other clauses there are brought in from federal definite from the federal definition. Yeah. But so there's nothing new there that isn't either in the federal law or in our current state law with regard to those at to that particular subdivision. But I thought that Joe's comments regarding section 3, 3254-1. Mm -hmm. The change in that language, um, that's, is that in the federal definition? It is. Yep. I mean, oh. And you oh. don't have to obviously go with that. You could go with the existing language there and add in the verbal or physical. So, I mean, I, I hear what Joe's saying, but I, I, I don't. I don't see it as big of a change again as as he does just a difference of opinion um between the two of us so um but you could say you know if you're really uncomfortable with the the new language in subdivision one i mean i don't know what the witnesses would think but i think you know you could just rely on the existing law lack of it may be shown without proof of verbal or physical resistance and i and i think i heard the attorney general say or attorney general's office say that in on page one, section one, three, don't need the words knowing and voluntarily. It just they they can be left as law. Right. I think you could. I think there is. You can interpret a knowing element <clears throat> voluntary. So I don't think it's absolutely necessary. I would agree there. Um, the question is: is you know, will you at some point if you decide to mark up the bill? kind of do an overhaul of the consent definition and bring some of the 3254 aspects into the definition of consent rather than well, having I'm, 32 I'm trying to prepare so that next week we can um, either decide we can do this bill this year or we can't do this bill this year. If we really, in fact, uh, are to be done by um, that our final week of committee time will be the week of the 19th of April, um, that doesn't give us a lot of time on a lot of these bills and this one certainly has a lot of good ideas in it but some concern has been expressed so um, so let me let's let's do the best we can um, see where we get at next week and if you can send out all of the people who are here today um, some copies of that side by side and some other thoughts that'd be helpful to all of them. Thank everybody for the participation. Joe, with a particular final comment? Yeah, Michelle, the uh, federal definition, the, um, the silence clause, if you will, has that ever been litigated? Do you know? I'll, ch I'll check. Okay. Because our current version of that phrase has been litigated. There is history there. I'm just kind of curious if the feds have actually looked at that specifically. <clears throat>